We give God all the praise and, and all the honor for who he is. And this is the day that the Lord has made. And we have come to rejoice and to be glad in it. To Pastor Maxwell, Melvin Maxwell. And to his lovely wife. And to all of the homileticians and pastors and preachers who have come. And to all the friends of God who have come to be here on this great day. I greet you in that name that is above every name. The Bible, the Bible. I'm a Bible man. The Bible says that the name of Jesus. Every knee must bow. And every tongue must confess. That he's Lord. Am I right about that? And he is Savior. We thank God. I want to thank the Lord for putting it on Dr. Maxwell's heart to allow me to come to be a part of this great seven last sayings of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't take this invitation lightly. And thank God for Dr. Maxwell. I've known him for many, many years. and Just want him to know publicly. I thank God for him. And you can always tell what kind of man you're dealing with, what kind of family you're dealing with when you see how folks raise their children. And so I've had a blessed opportunity to know him that long to see how the Lord has blessed him and his wife and his children and we thank God for for that I have been given the task of the first word father forgive them for they know not what they do there are a lot of everybody has to come down this road it might not be a Friday, but everybody has to come down the road when they're going to have some last words, some last sayings. The great athlete for the New York Yankees, Joe DiMaggio, on his deathbed said that he'll finally get an opportunity to see Marilyn Monroe one more time. People say strange things when they get to the end of their days. Yeah, as much as I love Humphrey Bogart, who allowed us to begin wearing trench coats, for those of you, I'm dating myself now, people don't wear trench coats, but yeah, Humphrey Bogart said on his deathbed he should have switched from scotch to martinis. <laughs> Everybody in, in a time of difficulty and get to the end of their days has some last sayings. I wonder what would happen if forgiveness was not in the vernacular of the God in Christ. Yeah, but what would we do? What would we be if we didn't have forgiveness? You know, after everything we've been through and every bad thing we've done, where would we be had it not been for forgiveness? The Bible, the Bible teaches us that there were some women who followed Jesus, a great company of people followed Jesus. I know you at verse number 31, but I have to begin at verse number 27, if you don't mind. I'm going to try to honor the time. But the Bible says that a great company followed him and women, and the women were bewailing him and lamenting about the fact that he had been hung high on his way to be hung high and stretched wide. You see, the thing about forgiveness is, is that God does have some conditions on forgiveness. 
you, 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 you have to understand the kind of God we serve. He has unmerited favor on our lives. He, he loves us so much that indeed he would take this road to go to Calvary. But I want somebody to know that God places some conditions on forgiveness. Now, he can forgive anybody for whatever they have done, but I want to stop by to let you know that in this instance, that there were some conditions attached to the forgiveness. Because the women who were following Jesus, the great company that was following Jesus, the thing about forgiveness, even though all of us need it, the fact of the matter is, just because somebody is following Jesus does not mean that they're willing to serve Jesus. Somebody better hear me talking in here today. There are a whole lot of folk who come to God's house, they say they follow in the Lord, but I, I stop by to tell somebody today that the people who are in this crowd, just because it's a crowd, doesn't mean it's a God crowd, but where I come from, I want to be with some folk who ain't mind giving God the praise, whether it's late night or late day, whether or not, you got a dollar man or a dime, it really doesn't matter where you come from, the issue is where you're going. Yes, yes, there's some conditions, there's some conditions because uh, on the outset, if you take a very cursory look at the story, you'll find out that these women were, it appears, crying and they were in a fit because Jesus was just about ready to put the nails in his hands and spikes in his feet and while they were berating him and lamenting him, they were really saying, oh, poor Jesus. Yeah, look at that fool. Yeah, yeah, he going to Calvary. I don't know why he's going to Calvary. Yeah, it reminded me of uh, what Joan Crawford said on her dying deathbed. She had a heart attack, and uh, her servant, her housekeeper, her maid told her, well, I'm going to call on the Lord. And, and Joan Crawford said, well, I tell you what, uh, don't you tell God about my situation. Well, suffice it to say, she went straight to hell. Yeah, you need forgiveness in order to go to heaven. But I come to tell somebody today, if you don't mind, Jesus let them know, don't you cry for me, don't you get mad, don't you worry about it, because the fact of the matter is, he told these daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me, because the days are going to come when you'll be glad when you couldn't have no children. And you know the Hebrews, yeah, women who were barren, it was a shame. Yeah, women who were unable to have children felt shameful if you didn't have children. And so I stopped by to tell somebody today, let me tell you something. If you ain't having children yet, don't you worry about it. God has everything in control because sometimes you just have to wait on God and wait on the Lord to send you what you need. And I tell you, I, I prayed to God and, and when God blessed me with a man child, I, I was barren at one time, but, but if you just hold on to God's unchanging hand, he'll bless you beyond measure, but you got to hold on. You got to wait for God. There, there's such a thing as, as waiting on God, and they that wait upon the Lord, he shall renew their strength. I don't know about you, but, but the truth of the matter is there's a level of criminality associated with Calvary. Yeah, yeah, there's a level of criminality associated with Calvary because the truth of the matter is now for the unbeliever, they're going to see it as homicide. Yeah, yeah, the atheist, the agnostic, somebody's going to say there was a homicide that took place on Good Friday. Lord have mercy. And if there's anybody who needs to know about homicide today, it's African American folk because I know what the police do. I know what law enforcement do. But guess what? We shoot each other more than anybody else in the world. We got no trouble in our own neighborhoods. Homicide. Yeah, yeah, there's a level of criminality. That's why we need forgiveness because there's a level of criminality associated with Calvary. But watch this thing. I don't have a whole lot of time. Watch this thing. This, these women, I don't want to get away from the women. We thank God had there not been women there. 
My God, we would have never heard the story about Jesus had it not been for some women. But the truth of the matter is, is, is that Jesus tells these daughters of Jerusalem it's going to get worse before it's going to get better. Yes, Lord, it's going to get worse. Uh, don't worry about it if you haven't had children yet. But the truth of the matter is, is what Jesus was trying to tell them. Watch it very carefully because he mentioned to them, blessed are the women that are bare and those who are not able to provide their young folk with milk. And the truth of the matter is, situations can get so hard for you, you want to give up. You'll be thinking that you want to give up and commit suicide. Yeah, yeah, hills fall down on us, mountains fall down on us. Well, that's why we need forgiveness. Yeah, because we in an era, we in a time where some folk just have given up on living. Yeah, it used to be a time when we didn't kill each other. It used to be a time when we didn't even commit suicide. But something is happening in our neighborhoods. We have forgot what it means to be in the forgiving business. We forgot how it meant to come to the Lord's house. We'll do everything else on the Lord's day except come to the Lord's house. But he gives, he gives, he gives. The predicament in the proverb, he lets them know, listen, you know what? It is going to get worse before it gets better. And he reminds us when he says and he gives this proverb about if they do these things in a green tree, what shall they do in the dry? In other words, what he's saying is, if they willing to kill an innocent man, yeah, just think what he going to do with all the rascals and all the people who are out here committing crimes. Boy, we got to thank God for Jesus. That's the time to forgive folks. See, the time to forgive folks is when they do you wrong. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right. Because, see, see, most of us, we couldn't go to Calvary not like Jesus went. Yeah, we couldn't do it. We couldn't do it. I, I know for me, when they start talking about putting a needle in me, when I go to the doctor, I start crying just because they need some blood. Make sure I ain't got cancer. I start hollering. My God, Lord, have mercy. I have to tell my children, tell my two boys. I got two grown boys. I don't want them to see me crying. Yeah, I tell them, man, his here. Y'all stay outside until the doctor finish with me because. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. But let me see how I can finish this up and I won't hold you long. This is the reason why we need forgiveness because there's some people who have been disingenuous to us. Yeah, they're not really concerned about Jesus. Yeah, they're interested in the show. Yeah, they don't really love Jesus. They're they just interested in his name. They're not going to serve him. Just interested in his name, but that's the people that we got to forgive. And so when you get down to verse number 31, and he says, Father, forgive them. He's talking about forgive the criminal elements that's in the crowd. Yes, yes, yes. So somebody has hurt our family. Somebody has killed somebody else's son. I'm here in Ward 7 and Ward 8. You know what happens on east of the river. You know what has going to happen on Friday. Somebody is not going to make it till Sunday morning. But I'm here to tell you that God is still in the forgiving business. We got to tell the criminal, listen here, this God we serve, he's able to do anything but fall. He went to Calvary. And when they nails in his hands. You see, I told you earlier that forgiveness is conditional. He didn't ask God to forgive them until they start putting nails in his hands and they start putting spikes in his feet. And that's why the Bible says, then Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. When I get to the end of my days, Lord have mercy. I don't know what I'm going to say. But I tell you what, here is what Harriet Tuckman said at the end of her day. She says, swing on, sweet chariot. I don't know about you, but Bessie Smith said, Lord, I'm 
still going, but I'm going in the name of the Lord. Can I get a witness in the house? But I'm here to tell somebody, thanks be to God, I haven't got to the end of my days. And until I get to the end of my days, the only things on my lips is to let somebody know that God, the God in Christ, I want somebody to hear me today. When I talk about God, I'm talking about the God in Christ. I'm talking about Christ is able to forgive. You see, the thing is, even though we laugh at Humphrey Bogart, even though we laugh at Joe DiMaggio, we've done some things in our lives that requires forgiveness. And had he not went to Calvary, there'd be no reason for us to come here on Sunday morning. But I've been drunk before. I've been out of my mind before. I've been hospitalized before. Can I get a witness in the house? But when I throw my mind in the verse and think about the goodness of Jesus and everything he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah, to the Lamb. Ain't God good? You got to know who to call. And so Jesus said, Give it honor first to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who are truly the head of my life. Yes, yes, yes. It gives me great honor and awesome privilege to stand behind the sacred desk on today. Amen. I want to first also give honor to the man of God, the angel of this assembly, Pastor Melvin Milton Maxwell. Yeah. And certainly to his lovely wife, First Lady Maxwell. I, too, was somewhat like Reverend Kitchens. I've known this man of God for a long time. 31 years, amen. amen. I've met this man of God through my uncle, Reverend Lee Dixon, who sits here. And I'm going back some years, amen. He was the youth minister, amen, in Plattsburgh, New York. And I was a young man who pretty much lost my mind. So don't nobody tell you the praise of the righteous don't avail much. I have the awesome assignment today, the number two word, our second word. It's coming from Luke chapter 23. I'm going to read verse 39. Amen, down to 40, 43. There was a But the other criminal, let me jump up to 39, amen. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered, truly, I tell you today, You'll be, you will be with me in paradise. If I had to have a topic for just a few minutes with you, it will soon be the confession of a crucified thief to a forgiven Savior. I 
How many of us know that at this time, this opportunity gives us a time to remember, to reflect for many of us what the Lord has done in our life, yeah. in our life's particular, yes. to the believer here. But as we look into our text, we see three persons being crucified on the cross, yeah. one on the left of our Savior and the other on the right. At least two has sin in them, but the one in the middle, our Savior, he has sin on him. The two, cru the two criminals who was crucified with him had probably never heard of him before. They were certain of no believing converts. They were no saints. They were convicted criminals. The word of God said that they were thieves, someone who stole in secret, usually without open face. These two criminals who was crucified with Jesus, we do not know their names, we know nothing about their lives, we know nothing about their misdoings. We do not know anything about them, even to the level of their guilt. It was even greater or could be than what we even think. We only know that the thieves were yet convicted and yet condemned. We see them as one who then admitted the due reward of their deeds. We know about all of that, that they consent and against their wishes, they were in fact crucified with Jesus. No one before, no one after has witnessed such a directly and so closely God's action of reconciliation. God's glory and the redemption of the world. And these two things true, only one of them acknowledged who Jesus was and what he did in the suffering and death for all men at the cross. His companions in later recording the gospel showed in the general grind and the hollow mockery, utter disrespect. The scripture referred to him as the malefactor, the malefactor, the malefactor, but yet defined as a hooligan, a delinquent, a villain, a culprit, a wrongdoer. Some may even see a hoster, a gangster. This is another word that we can use, but simply one who was guilty of the crime. Jesus says, if you thou be, Jesus says this. As he look at all that, actually he says nothing. And one couple goes on to say this, if you be Christ, save yourself and also us. And this is of a certain importance and notable difference between the two criminals. The thief had no remorse. He had no change. He had no respect. He had no fear of God. But something happened in the midst of this shift. Something happened. Something happened in the midst of them hanging on the cross. One turned around in the midst of Acts. Do you not fear God? If you go back and study the word of God, you understand that this one too was also in the beginning doing relevance to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He was also being ones who were speaking down on him and cursing him and making fun of him. But something happened in the midst of the cross. Something took place. I believe there's a shift in the spiritual realm. Something began to move at another level. Matthew 12, 26 say, the word reminds me of this, that if Satan cast out Satan, his kingdom is divided against himself. The Bible said that that, that that second thief, the one on the right, said to him, I re he rebuked him basically. He said, have you have not fear of, of who God is? And, I'm, and I understand this, that he couldn't do that unless he had some type of relationship with Christ. I just believe it may have took place up on the cross as he looked at him, something happened in the spirit that he began to see this was the son of God. This was the man who prayed for him. I believe that something had took place in the natural as well as the spiritual. Somebody need to hear this today. In the midst of the happening, he began to look at him a little bit different. He didn't see the one he started out with. Speaking words of this words of disrespect. I, I want to talk to somebody today who may not be saved. I want to encourage somebody who may not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That the very reason he was up there was for you. The very reason he was up there was for me. He was not there just for those who had it going. He was up for those who was a little bit lost and tossed. He was up for those to the one who was yet a sinner man. This man was a sinner man. He was yet a thief. He was yet a villain. He was yet a culprit. He was yet one who made a mistake. He was yet one who yet didn't do the right thing. Maybe his family wasn't in his life. Maybe he disrespected. Maybe he didn't listen to grandma and granddad. But in the midst of all this, something this needs to, need to be said. Jesus Christ sat up there and died for him. The reason he was there was yet for him. I want to give you a few confessions of this crucified conviction. Of this crucified thief. When he began to look at Jesus, something take place over in in, in, in the scripture, he began to say this. He said to him, he said, after the very fact that he made a rebuke to the first thief, he told me, he said, listen. He told me, he said, we are punished justly, for we are getting what we deserve. 
and this man has done nothing. I need somebody to hear that today. Because yet while he was sitting there, something took place in his confession. He began to confess that he was a sinner. He said, what we're getting coming to us is what we deserve. I need somebody to hear me today because it's time out for food. It's time out for blaming the brain game on somebody else. Somebody got to get to a point in time in their life where they take control of their own actions. Come on now. I know you want to keep on blaming sister and brother and blaming cousin, but it comes to a point in your life where you begin to say enough is enough. Huh? I can't blame it on mama no more. I, I can't blame it on daddy no more. I got to be a, com a confrontation of what I've done. And this what he say, Jesus, I'm a sinner and, and, and I need you right there. And not only that, now there's something else took place. He looked over and said, this this man has done nothing wrong. I did something wrong. Holly, I need somebody to get that in your spirit because here it is, the first confession. He confessed that he was a sinner. I need somebody to get that in, in your spirit because oftentimes we can't get no further than what we say because the words of our testimony can shift things. The words that we speak in our mouth can shift things. And until we take place of the things we've done and get out the blame game, come on now, take responsibility, come on now. I need somebody to hear me. I need some husband to take responsibility of your household. I need some husband to take responsibility of your families. I need some husband to take responsibility of your children. I need some men. I need, come on, I need somebody to come in agreement with what God is saying because it's time out for the blame game. Somebody got to get to a place in their life and say, oh, 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 forget this. Enough is enough. Now here it is. Think about it. He's up on the cross. And, and, and he's hurt because he got these he got he got these nails in his arms. Come on now. He's looking like Jesus. Come on now. The son, if you're the son of man, if, what, listen, his counterpart said, if you're the son of man, if you're the son of God, get us down from here. Let me go back to that for a second. See, he said that because he was selfish. He said that because he didn't want to take responsibility. He said that because he, he wanted to do the blame game. Listen, listen, if you got it going on like that, get us all. Let me tell you something. Until you get to that place, they know what? I made the mistake. I'm telling somebody today. See, 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 see. Not only that, but, but he began to have an understanding because it's someone in a confession where you understand who Jesus is. Not just by what you're but he had a revelation that this man is innocent. Come on now. The same one, the same civil uh, um, 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 uh, authority, come on now, tried to, uh, try to find something on him, but couldn't find nothing on him. Come on now. They had to, they had to let him go. They were sending him back and forth to each other until they finally turned him over to the people. Tell somebody, what's, his, what's your confession? Not only that, but there, there was another confession he made. He went on to go on and say, and the word of God said, and he looked over, and he began to, he, began to, he called him out to something. He said, he, he said this, he said, Lord, he said, Lord, I need somebody to hear that day. Lord, remember me. I need somebody to hear that day. That's the second confession. He began to confess him as Lord. Come on now. Uh, you got to get to that next place uh, of, of, of your deliverance, of your breakthrough, of your, of your increase, um, of your movement in the body of Christ. Um, of, uh, just understand the Bible says us uh, that, that, that if you confess, if you confess with your mouth, come on now. You can't got to confess to your mouth that he's Lord. Come on now. I need somebody to get that in your spirit. There's an unbeliever here today. There's no other way you can get around it. There's no other way you can get to him. Huh? You got to open your mouth and confess it with your mouth. Huh? Somebody said there's another. There's no other way. Huh? There's only one way. Huh? You got to confess in your mouth and believe in your heart. And you got to get to this point and place in your life that you got to get tired of. Let me tell you something. Yes, sir. I remember one time, good God, before I gave Jesus my life, good Lord have mercy, my wife. I said, babe, I think I'm going to be a Muslim. And I remember going into the mosque, I had my wife, and she looked at me, she said, baby, this ain't, this ain't what God told us. I'm only saying it because you got to make sure you line up with somebody who's in the right mind. Come on, somebody can bring, come out can bring agreement. Huh? I didn't have my right mind, but she looked at me and said, this ain't it, baby. I could have tell somebody, but Jesus said, you have to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. Good God, that they come on who I am. And, and that's what he did, he, he, he confessed it. You can't find another way. I'm trying to tell somebody today. The road is narrow. It's, 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 it's a narrow pathway. And there's only one way to get to him. You got to get to him through the sun. Come on in. You got to get to him through Jesus. I know my time is short. Come on now, because as leaders, we, we teach others. Amen. To be obedient to time. So let me, let, let me, let me tighten it up a little bit. It's up. Uh-oh. He said it's up. The last thing that took place that I just want to bring to your attention as I'm closing out now. That when he got to that place, he looked over at Jesus because he said, you know what? I believe who you are. I confess that you are 
the Lord is saying, I confess, I'm, I'm speaking this out of mouth, but it took a level of faith to do that. So the Bible says, impossible to please God without faith. There's certain things that you just got to do by faith. You're looking for a whole lot of extra stuff, but it got to be done by faith. Come on now. And then when he gets to this place, uh, and he, he looks over at him, and he says this, and it happens by faith. He goes on to say that, uh, 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 Jesus, um, remember me when you get into the kingdom. He said this by faith. I know this now. I know I'm on my way to hell, but if you could just remember me, if you could come back to this place and do it again and remember me that I was here and I believe to just remember me. Somebody got to get to the place in your life that you begin to speak out to the Lord and tell her, remember me, because it's not it right here. There's another place. There's a kingdom. There's a, there's, there's a heaven that we're going to get to. And he looks at him and he said this by faith. Remember me. I'm saying this to somebody today because I don't care what you've done in your life. I don't care the mistakes you made. I don't care what they said to you. I don't care what they say you couldn't do. You may be the murderer. You may be the thief. You may be the liar. You may be the, may be the midnight walker, the overnight stalker. You may be the one who did the things they said you did. But I come to tell you right there, just as that thief hung out on the cross, uh, just as he stood there, he looked over and said, hold on, uh, uh, hold up. Uh, I'm the one. He's not the one. I'm the one that messed up. You got to come to the point to understand that you messed up. You gotta come to the point of understand that you gotta make a word. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta accept him by faith. You gotta speak out. You gotta believe in your heart, but yet confess with your mouth. He look over to him, and he tell him right there. He said, "You know what?" He tells him this. He tells us, "I'm closed out." He said, "Truly." He said, "Truly." It's just me. I'm telling you the truth. I want you. I want you to bank on this. Truly, I tell you today. Not next year, not next week. He tells him, I want to say, you don't got to go to you got to go to purgatory and wait a little while. I'm telling you, this day, this day, today, you will be with me in paradise. And I need somebody to understand this is how this is the hope that we have, the hope of glory that we have. That, that it's not something going to take place next year. That when that time comes, that we will be with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The confession. The confession of a crucified thief. He got this day. Can I say to somebody, because somebody, I'm closing up, thank you. It's all right, all right, Pastor. And I, and I, bless you, sir, bless you. Stop making excuses. Stop, listen, 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 stop making excuses. You need to make your, we need to get your way. You need to get your way down to that altar and give him your life. Let him know that today, today, just as, just as he made, and just as he got revelation, God's giving you revelation. I don't care who the unbeliever is. And if there's some carnal minded believers who need to get back, get back. But make your mind up today. Would you, would you bow your heads and pray with me? Eternal God, our Father. The story is an old story, but it never gets old. For every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus, I love him more and more. We're humbled to be in your presence. Thank you for the preachers that have come before, those that will come after. Speak through me and help me bless your people. We thank you in advance for what you have already designed in glory. In Jesus' name, amen. A little housekeeping really briefly. We'd like to give a big shout out to Pastor Maxwell. For organizing, for organizing this great service. I said there's great service. Isn't it already a great service? And to the leadership team here at East Friendship for coming alongside him and pulling it all together. Give yourselves a great big hand. Come on, y'all. 
And then lastly, um, when you, I need 12 people out there. I have something that never leaves my side. I need 12 people out there to say, remember the bag. Remember the bag. Yeah, say that before I close though, all right? <laughs> say, remember the bag. Because it's such a part of me, I'm liable to forget. What you gonna say? Okay, that's 12 people. All right. Amen. I invite your attention to the gospel as it has been recorded by John, chapter 19, verses 26 and 27. Right. And as you turn there, you'll find these words written. When Jesus then saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. And briefly, I just want to attempt to preach from the subject, Jesus prepped, I prep. Jesus prepped, I prep. I know at this point you're wondering what in the world is Pastor Lee talking about? In addition to being a gospel preacher, I am very much an advocate of other subcultures. Can you say amen? amen. And as much as I am a born again Christian, I am also a prepper. Everybody say prepper. A prepper is a person who believes that a catastrophic disaster or emergency is likely to occur in the future and makes active preparations for it. Typically, we do things like stockpile food. Typically, we stockpile things like ammunition we stockpile things like water purification tablets. We have things like first aid equipment all the time. Can you say amen? The reality is black people are the most unprepared and underprepared for these type of events. I'm going to walk down your street in a minute. But if you just think this is some platform Pastor Lee is on, you ought to ask the relatives of the deceased in the lower ninth ward in Louisiana. You ought to ask the residents of Flint, Michigan, what happens when you're unprepared. And y'all are right here in the DMV. If you drive up north 95, there's a, at least a three-decade-old problem right in Baltimore City with lead-based paint, and people are dying. I stopped by to tell you that Jesus prepped, and I prepped. I've also stopped by to tell you that out of all the things you can prep for, one of the things that is the hardest to prep for is for someone you love to be suffering and dying. Can you say amen? 
I need some 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 people who were health care providers and primary caretakers of people who were suffering to be a witness today to declare that it is hard to watch someone you love suffer and die. That's why I wanted to say that Jesus prepped and I prepped. You can see Jesus prepping because the reality is he knew a catastrophic event would happen. He said it his whole ministry, didn't he? He said, I came to seek and to save that which is lost and give my life a ransom for many. He said things like, you tear this temple down. And I'll build it up in three days. He said things like as Jonah was in the belly of the fish. See, he knew he was going to die, didn't he? He knew and he was prepared. And he prepped for that catastrophic event when he died. And we see it right here in the text that he did not want to leave his mother uh, alone. Am I right about it? Somebody said you can tell a man. By the way, y'all going to talk back? By the way, he treats his mother. You know a man that doesn't treat his mother any good ain't going to treat you like, come on somebody, like nothing. Am I right about that there? Touch two people and say, I know that's right. Ain't going to treat you like nothing. The reality is this. Jesus cared about treating and how he treated his mother. That's why some of y'all doing that online dating You see the pictures online, and you see the biography online, but you can't see how that Negro, y'all not helping me, has treated his mama. They got the nerve to have ChristianMingle.com. Y'all not helping me. PlentyOfFish.com. I'm going to call yours after a while. Come on, y'all. Come on, shout it out, somebody. Y'all know what it is. Don't act like you don't know what it is. I'm going to get. I'm going to get out your way. I'm going to get out your business. I, pastor, I wasn't asked to get in their business just to do the third word, the third saying. But you can't do nothing because I prep anyhow, yeah? So there's three things, three things real quick, and I'll be out your way. Three things that are in this text that are significant about Jesus' preparation, his prepping. I'm going to call them out real quick. I'm going to say a few things, and I promise in the next four or five minutes I'll be gone. Uh, first thing is, uh, Jesus is committed to care for you. Secondly, if Jesus cared for his own in weakness, how much more will he care for you in his power? And then lastly, you're blessed to be in the family. Jesus is committed to care for you. At first glance, you would say, Jesus is a mighty good man because he cared for mama. At first glance. But because we're not Catholic, we don't exalt Mary to a place that the Bible doesn't. 
Am I right about it? The truth is, we are not clear if at this point, Mary was definitely a believer or not. We do know that she knew that she would be the mother of God. But even Jesus' own brothers did not believe until after the resurrection. The Bible is silent if, with regard to if Mary was born again at this time. What we do know, though, is that Jesus redefined family. In Luke 8, verses 19 through 21, his mother came to him and his brothers also, and they were unable to get to him because of the crowds. And it was, it was reported to him, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wishing to see you. But he answered, and said to them, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Uh, this doesn't depreciate biological family. What it does, it elevates those who are in obedience to the word of God. On one hand, it was risky and dangerous to believe. On the other hand, you were safe, secure, and sanctified in the Lord's hands. Am I right about it? Jesus is committed to care for you if you've been born again, if you're more than a hearer of the word, and if you are a doer also. He is flat out committed to caring for you. That's why people uh, out of context just grab on the low. I'll be with you always, even to the end of the world. But they don't realize he said some stuff before that. Go and teach all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Teaching them. To, in other words, if you're obedient to doing what I said do, I am going to be with you. But you can't be out there doing just, y'all not going to help me. And then call on him. Second thing, if Jesus cared for his own in weakness. How much more will he care for you in his power? Make no mistake about it. The son of man in our text, as these two previous brothers clearly communicated, he was in weakness. We know he was emotionally weak from the garden of Gethsemane. He prayed as it were, drops of blood his emotional state was so overloaded that his blood capillaries began to explode and blood came through his pores he was emotionally troubled he even said my soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death so he was emotionally burdened and God have mercy, physically, he was dehydrated. He was sleep deprived. And now he's got rusty nails in his hands and rusty spikes in his feet. And then to top that all off, it was the equivalent of all of the sins of the world being placed on his shoulders Jesus was in weakness. But even in weakness, he was still ministering to John and to Mary. And I come by to ask you a question. If he could do all that with, with saliva filling up in his lungs... If he could do all that, losing blood. If he could do all that, dehydrated and sleep deprived. 
What in the wide world of sports do you think that he can do right now sitting at the right hand of the throne of the Lord? What do you think that he can do right now with all power in his hand? What do you think that he can do right now since he spent, sent the Holy Ghost down? I tell you, if he cared for you in weakness, how much will he care for you in his power? Last, last, and then I leave. I leave. You see, the text says when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, behold your son. He said to his disciple, behold your mother. And he took, uh, the disciple took her in his whole how in his own household, what that is symbolic of, beloved, is that the biological family, as grand as it is, that God fixes things up in the church age when he baptizes us into the body of Christ and he creates an interdependence. And what that means is you're never alone. Somebody's got your back. And we know that God's got your back in glory. But how many people know that it's good down here on earth to have some folk who will ride with you, who will hold you down, who will pray for you, that will give you something when you're in need, that will help you when you're down, that will weep when you, with you when you weep, and that will encourage you when you need encouragement now I'm going to close but what did I tell you you told me <laughs> to remember the bag and I told you Jesus prepped and I also prep in this bag I've got things like gauze for somebody get hurt I've got blood clot equipment. Should somebody get shot and I'm around. I've got alternative light sources in the bag. I got fire sources in the bag because I'm ready for an emergency and I'm ready for a catastrophe. But what I tell people in the prepping community that there's something that this bag can't do. I can't put the blood in the bag. I can't put his name in the bag. There's power in the blood let us pray Father God I want to pause for a moment to say thank you and to bless your name Jesus for being a part of this service and to be reminded of your final words and what they mean to us, God, our salvation, our sanctification, God. So, Father, I pray as I share this fourth word that you will let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer and my soon coming king. In Jesus' name we pray. Let us say amen. Amen. Praise God. Haven't you been blessed so far? Yeah. Oh, glory to God. Glory to God. Thank God for these mighty men of God. Amen. That have really broken the word down to us. And truly, we want to thank our brother, our friend, our mentor, uh, Pastor Melvin Maxwell. That's right. Give it up for him. And First Lady Maxwell. As it already been stated for hosting this event, 
And uh, certainly I want to thank them for inviting me because I uh, certainly am the least of these amongst these great men and women of God. And that is the truth. Uh, I've been preaching for about five or six years now. I'm serving as the associate uh, pastor, youth pastor uh, at the Greater Good Samaritan Baptist Church where my dad has been serving for uh, 26 years. We're right over uh, East Capitol Street uh, in the old uh, uh, Eastgate community. Praise God. So I just thank God for uh, Pastor Max thinking enough of me. Praise God to allow me to come and share with you. And uh, I'm not a, I'm not, I'm a preacher, but I'm not a, a preacher preacher. <laughs> Praise God. So I'm going to talk to you for a few minutes. So if, you're, if your neighbor starts to get sleepy, just nudge him and say, he's still talking. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Bless you. Thank you for your support. Bless you. Bless you. Let's look at Matthew 27. Uh, actually, let me do this. I want to thank God for my daughters, my two daughters. Will you stand up for me, please? Timonea, Thessalonia. The joy of my life, God has graced me to, uh, to raise these wonderful young women. Timonea will be going to University of Maryland in the fall. political science major, and Thessy is an honor student at Washington Christian Academy in ninth grade. And I think I saw Evangelist Beard, uh, who's on the staff at our church. God bless you. Thank you for being here. And if I missed anyone, God bless you. Thank you for coming. Let's look at Matthew 27, 45, and 46. I'm going to read it, and I, I, I probably will be seven minutes or less. Praise God. Seven minutes or less. <laughs> My church knows I'm, I'm very brief, very brief. I think that's why they show up, because I don't, I don't preach that long. <laughs> All right, let us, let us read. It says, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I just want you to keep this thought in your mind uh, as we look at these uh, two scriptures. He was forsaken so that we may be forgiven. He was forsaken so that we may be forgiven. As we look at this first uh, 45th verse, it says that now from the sixth hour, which was about 12 noon, this was a time when the sun should have been at its zenith. It should have been at its, its height. So there was darkness over the land until the ninth hour. So that was approximately from 12 to 3 p.m. And, and this was a very peculiar event. As a matter of fact, this event is recorded in secular history, in Roman history. Uh, it was recorded that this event took place. So we know it's factual. We know it took place. It was a divine darkness because God had caused it. Again, it was unusual because it took place at midday. I don't know about y'all, but I've had some moments in my life where, hey amen, I had some dark times in my life, and it was midday. Praise God, the sun was shining, the birds were chirping, the smell of the spring flowers, but it was dark because of what I was going through. Some of y'all may be going through some dark times right now. Maybe a family situation. Maybe a job situation, maybe something going on in your body, health. But I want you to know that the darkness that Jesus went through was so that we can have forgiveness. Amen. Amen. Now, this darkness uh, was not God's way of covering the nakedness of uh, the nakedness of Jesus. It was not uh, to cover the public shame of Jesus. Uh, this darkness was not even to protest what was going on. This darkness, in fact, was the judgment. It was divine judgment of Jesus. If we had time, we would go through the Old Testament and give you demonstration of how God has used darkness in times past. And if we look in the book of Revelation, God is going to use darkness, amen, to judge in the latter days. Uh, we, we got some dark times even going on in our world right now. 
I, I mean, we can start with our community. I mean, I don't have to name all of the things that are going on in our community. I was at a community meeting last week, and it said that 46 youth were arrested in the month of March in Ward 7. And all of it was marijuana related. So we're experiencing some darkness. So we, we, we can relate what it's like to be, uh, to deal with darkness, but no darkness could compare to this darkness that Jesus experienced because it was divine judgment. Yeah. And the question you may be asking yourself is, why was Jesus being judged? You know, Jesus was perfect, is that right? The Bible said that he knew no sin, but he became sin for our sake so that we may become righteous. So why was God judging his beloved son? Well, he was judging his son again so that we can receive forgiveness. See, God was, even though Jesus never sinned, God was placing all of the sin of the world on Jesus. Now, that is a mystery to even know how God could place the sin of the world on Jesus. He placed all of the past sin, amen, all of the current sin and all future sin on Jesus. And because he placed it on Jesus, as it was talked about earlier, we can have forgiveness. We can have access to God. We can have the power of God in our life. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. 1 Peter 2, 24 says, Who his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto the righteousness of God, by whose stripes you were healed. Saints of being betrayed by the very people that he created. He was abandoned by Peter and, and the other disciples. Amen. And he was... He was uh, screaming because of the agony of seeing his mother watch him uh, be crucified. His mother watching him and the concern he had for his mother. Amen. Praise God. But the most notable agony that Jesus was screaming yeah. was the agony from having his sinless, holy, and unblemished body contaminated with sin for the entire world. All of the drugs that some of us took, praise God. All of the liquor that some of us drank. Some of the sex outside the marriage that we had. The marijuana that we puffed. Jesus took all of that on him so that we can be forgiven. Jesus was screaming out in Aramaic. So this was a personal pronoun when he said, my God, my God. That is to say, you are mine. I belong to you and you belong to me, Why, where did you go? He was departing from Jesus. This is a profound event. It's almost like a reverse miracle. It's like a negative miracle. The fact that this triune, triune God that says in Deuteronomy, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, that he would temporarily release himself from fellowship from Jesus. Now, we, as much as, as great a theologians we have, we can't really figure that out. How God separated himself from Jesus because God cannot dwell in sin. I mean, we barely understand the Trinity, amen? <laughs> so how are we going to explain this? But this is a profound event, a negative miracle, that God temporarily removed himself from fellowship with Jesus so that he can have fellowship with us. Amen. Amen. And as I close, we have to remember that Jesus, the Son of God, endured the most agonizing, shameful, humiliating torture in his body, his soul, and his spirit in order that you and I can be forgiven of our sins and have access to the power of God to live a godly life yes. and to live an abundant life. Amen. Amen. He was forsaken, y'all, yeah. so that we can be forgiven. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Anybody know about divine departure? Divine departure. Y'all write that down. I'm going to preach that one day. I'm going to. I'm going to maximize that joint. <laughs> I'm going to maximize that. 
Listen, get your offerings out. We're not going to belabor this point because we want to go right back to the word. Amen. Get your offering out. We've got enough people in here. We want to be a blessing to all these people. Let's put your hands together and give God some praise. Uh, uh, how many of you know that God is mighty, mighty good? And he's worthy to be praised. Uh, we give God glory and honor and certainly to God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Our comforter and teacher. Indeed, we are very excited and delighted that the esteemed pastor of the great church over here on this side of Ward 7, uh, East Friendship, Pastor Maxwell, let's put a round of applause together. He's indeed God's servant and God's man. And I thank God for him. And to his leading lady, amen. We are indeed grateful um, to be here and celebrate. To all of those that bear the burden as well as the blessing of preaching. Uh, those heralds and homileticians who are here. Put your hands together for them. I uh, must say that so I can go home today. I must introduce you to the glaze on my honey bun. I's married, y'all. Amen. Reverend Karen Curry. Amen. And certainly I see a couple of deacons and others who are here from Pennsylvania Avenue Church, and I'm grateful that you are here. Amen. Now, I won't be before you long, but I did break a button um, before I got up here, and I put it in the same pocket as that ginger ball. I usually put one under my tongue when I start to preach. So I'm praying that I didn't put that button under my tongue. You'll get that one when you go home. The word of the Lord says in John 19 and 28, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Or another version said, I am thirsty. So for a few moments, I want to share from I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. Uh, I just do this so that I, I'm a little comfortable. Uh, say, neighbor, neighbor old, friend, old friend, can a brother get a drink? Get a drink? All right. <laughs> Y'all will be all right. Uh, the celebrated theologian James Cone, in his book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, reminds us that Christian identity ought to be very clearly focused when we understand that the cross and the lynching tree are parallel realities. What he has concluded, and I agree, is that Jesus' crucifixion was as much of a lynching as it was during slavery. Here we are, four to five hours. Jesus' body is severely beaten, sweaty, and his colored body 
yeah, yeah. has been nailed to the cross in the humid hot sun rivlets of blood run slowly down his body he hangs there dehydrated distressed and dying he's a victim of soldier i mean police brutality uh, unjust jurisprudence and illegal sentencing to death Though not though fully God, the human suffering servant cries out with a loud voice, I'm thirsty. Can a brother get a drink? Dying folk are often thirsty. You need to understand that I know what I'm talking about because in 2015, before my mother transitioned to glory, she was under hospice care and nearing the end of her journey. We would take a little stick, if you will, with a sponge on it, dip it in some water to try to quench her thirst. She was parched. She was thirsty. And mama eventually transitioned and, but did help me understand something. What it must have been like for Jesus as he getting ready to expire and die. Jesus had been thirsty before. You remember him with the woman at the well when he said, give me the drink. Uh, but now the living water himself is parched and nearing death. Jesus is human and he suffers just like us. How many of you know we need a savior who knows the hell we go through dealing with despicable and dastardly Negroes who betray you after eating at your own dinner table. Come here, Judas. You were that one. We need a deliverer. Who, when we are depressed and we're really ready to give up and pull the ejector seat, we need somebody that's going to pull us out of the valley of the shadow of death. Make our bosses behave. Remove cancer from a doctor's report and make our money outlast our bills. We need a liberator. One who cancels debt, frees us from bondage, and doesn't let a cloud remain over our heads. Our Savior must suffer just like us. But not only must he suffer like us, he must suffer with us. I come to the garden alone where the dew is still on the roses. Y'all know what I'm talking about. But song later says he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me that I'm his own. When everyone deserts me and when your friends leave you, I'm never alone because Jesus is forever with me. God may have turned his back on Jesus while sin was upon him, but ultimately he didn't forsake him while he's hanging on a lynching tree. Is there anybody in here that's going through right now? You feel like giving up right now. Understand and realize that God is one that's going through with you even right about now. God is remaining so close to you that even when he can't look at you or can't stand what you're doing, he's loving you anyhow. Uh, so now on this tree, Jesus not only suffers like us, not only suffers with us, but he also suffers for us. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Indeed, he bore our sins in his body on that cursed tree. 
And as such, he was one that was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of peace was upon his shoulders, and by his stripes we were healed. He's an advocate who is in our corner. He indeed bumps for us when we need bumping for. Now, some of y'all don't understand what I say bump, what I'm talking about. But I want to tell you, I played the fraternity a long time ago, and there every now and then when we were going through some things, I won't tell you what. I, I, I want you to understand that every now and then my line brother who was behind me would stand in front of me so that I would not receive what was coming to me. Y'all better hear me. And then I just watched that cross because I realized that as Jesus did the same thing, he stepped right in front on the cross so that the wrath of God would not be able to touch me. My Jesus bumped for me. Aren't you glad that Jesus stepped in? And aren't you glad that you don't have to receive the punishment that was due you? Jesus bumped for you. And he revealed the fact that he got you covered. Is there anybody in here that understands that when the Lord covers you, he doesn't cover you partially, but he covers you completely. I wish I had some covered folk in the building that understood that God is always bumping for you. God is always right there for you. God is always there going to hold your hand and dry your tears. I'm covered, y'all. You ought to be able to rejoice because our Messiah would not come down from the cross just to save himself. But I tell you, rather, he stayed focused on his mission. Jesus, knowing that all things were accomplished, here Jesus refused to abandon his assignment despite being beaten, mocked, burden on the cross, nailed to the cross, hoisted up on the cross. He didn't lose and was attentive to every detail because he didn't lose focus. Do whatever the Lord has called you to do. You need to just do it. Can I talk to you for a minute? Let me tell you, none of us need to be derelict in our duty. We need to carry out our duty with excellence. If you've been called to usher a work in the culinary ministry, if you've been called to be a deacon or sing in the choir, you need to realize that if God didn't tell you to quit, you need to stay on in there and tackle your assignment. See, really, this ain't about you. This is kingdom business. See, a charge to keep I have, a God to glorify, to serve this present age, a calling to fulfill. But how do I remain focused on my assignment when I'm hanging on a cross in the middle of distress? I want you to know we need a word from the Lord. The Bible says that the scripture might be fulfilled. He real reveals that Jesus was familiar with the word of the true and living God. How could he not be? Because he was the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. But the only way that the scripture gets fulfilled is by knowing the scripture. Jesus knew the law, the prophet, and the Psalms. He was diligently taught as a child, taught all around the house. When he went walking, while he was lying down, while he was raising up, it was bound to his head, hung before his eyes, placed on the doorpost, and he heard about it in the synagogue. Jesus was saturated with the word. And I got to tell you today, I don't know about you, but when I'm stressed, pressed, and under duress, 
I need a word from the Lord. When my bad days outweigh my good days, and I've had a hell of a week, I need a word from the Lord. Is there anybody in here who needs a word from the Lord? When hell is closing in on you, and you don't know which rascal to trust, I need a word from the Lord. I need you to understand that the church has secrets and sometimes ungodly negroes try to rule a day but when that situation occurs I need a word from the Lord when people won't change their minds and their attitudes are all jacked up rather than listening to what the preacher has to say or rather than listening to what others have to say I need a word from the Lord is there anybody in here that know that the word of the Lord is active, operative, and energizing, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing through and dividing the sunder of the soul and the spirit, the joint and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Do you need a word from the Lord? It's the word that penetrates your soul, a word that makes you whole, a word that transforms your existence, a word that makes brand new. Is there anybody in here that needs a word from the Lord? Is there anybody in here that understands that God made a way out of no way when he hung Jesus on the cross? I need you to know that while the word was hanging, it was hanging in the back balance for you but because the word hung in there you got a word that makes you steadfast immovable always abounding in the work of the Lord I need a word from the Lord can I tell you this when you really look at the text the Bible says that when you read it carefully Jesus is right there in Psalm 22. So if you need a word from the Lord, watch this. Jesus also got a hymn that's part of his word from the Lord. When he starts as most Jewish boys begin to chant the halal psalm when they're young in age. I can see that Jesus in his mind is going through and letting everyone know that he's checking what is in the scripture to see if it's consistent. With what has already been said. Watch it. Psalm 22 says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's verse 1. But by the time he gets to verse 15, he says, my mouth is dried up like pots heard, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. That ought to tell you something. What it says to us is when we need a word from the Lord, we ought to have a song that we can also sing. What is your song? I can say, is it amazing grace? How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. You need a song. What's your song? Mine is, oh, I want to see him. Look upon his face. There to sing forever of his saving grace on the streets of glory. Let me lift my voice. Cares all pass home at last ever to rejoice is there anybody in here that has a song to sing I can tell you that if we could sing it I know it was the blood I know it was the blood I know it was the blood that saved me 
one day when I was lost, Jesus died on the cross. I know it was the blood that saved me. Is there anybody here that understands you need the blood? Is there anybody here that when Jesus is dehydrated and thirsty, your soul starts to move within you? It's a physical thirst, but it's also a spiritual thirst. For as the deer pants for running waters, so my soul pants for your you oh God my thirst is for the living God is there anybody here that can trust and understand that Jesus is not only thirsting for what is physical in terms of water or wine but he's there right there also thirsty for the almighty God himself is there anybody here that has suffered and understood that sometimes in life Life. You need a deeper relationship with God. Sometimes in life, you recognize you can't do it all by yourself. Sometimes in life, you find yourself beginning to thirst. So beyond all the vinegar you can drink, beyond all of the things you can say, I just want you to know that I'm thirsty. I need fellowship with my God. I'm thirsty. I need my God to hold my my hand and dry my tears. I'm thirsty for his unspeakable joy. I'm thirsty for his unmatched peace. I'm thirsty for his unconditional love. I'm thirsty for his steadfast faithfulness. I'm thirsty for his extreme favor. I'm thirsty for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Why should I feel discouraged when the shadows come why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and of home when jesus is my portion a constant friend is he his eye is on the sparrow and i know he watches over me i sing because i'm thirsty i sing because i'm free his eye is on the sparrow and i I know, I know, I know, I know, I know he watches over me. Is there anybody in here that will give a brother a drink? Because I'm thirsty for his love. I'm thirsty for his kindness. I'm thirsty for his peace. I'm thirsty so he can hold my hand and dry my tears. Is there anybody in here that understands that the God we serve wants you to thirst for him? Can you say yeah? Say yes, say yes, say yes, say yes, I'm thirsty for him. Can you say it one more time? High five three people and say I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. I need the Lord and I need him right now. Can you say yeah? Say yes, say yes. Say yes, say yes, yeah! I know he's all right. Our Father and our God, we are grateful to stand for you one more time. I humbly ask that you will forgive me of all sin. 
fill me with the Holy Ghost and cover me with an anointing that will make preaching effective and inspirational in this place. Do not allow me to speak as a mere mortal man, but as an oracle of Jesus Christ. It's in Jesus' name we ask it all. And the redeemed of the Lord said, Amen. 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 Praises be to God. We give God all the glory. We recognize our God as our Father, the creator of every good and perfect gift. We thank God for just being God. And we thank God for giving us his son, Jesus, who is the Christ, who came to retrieve us when we were lost. And we thank Jesus for leaving us the Holy Spirit, our comforter and our guide. And we thank God for this great pastor, Pastor Melvin Maxwell. God bless you, sir. Amen. Now the person who's supposed to be my friend has dug this deep hole for me. My God. The gospel according to John, the 19th chapter, around the 29th and 30th verses, reads something like this from the King James rendering of the text. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it in his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. You've already heard this, but for the time that is ours, and certainly with the help of the Holy Spirit, we want to talk to you from this thought, a word from the Lord. A word from the Lord. Saints, I don't know about you. But the one thing that I despise in life is wasting time talking to people who don't know what they're talking about. I don't know about anybody else, but in my little life, it seems as though those who have the least to say talk all of the time. It agitates me and aggravates me to no avail to have to be pastoral and sit down and engage people in conversation who literally sound like they just woke up on the wrong side of the bed and just dealt with the worst hangover of their lives. That is one side of the equation. However, there are some people that just have a special way with words. There are those that you love to engage in conversation because they just have such a grasp of the language. Every now and then it is words that will attract you to somebody that you're not physically attracted to. I believe that's why that unattractive brother who could sing so beautifully sang that song, Come and Talk to Me. I really want to, I wish I had some real saints in the house. Yes, they just have such a grasp of language and an eloquence of speech that they are always saying things that are deeply profound. And the one thing I learned when I read the Gospels is that the Jesus that I serve was a person like that. Jesus had a way with words, and everything that he said was deep and profound. All through the years of his recorded ministry, there were, one, there were those who he spoke to, and when he spoke to them, they were just spellbound. And that thing that he said to them most of the time left them in a manner where they were speechless and just clamoring for more of what Jesus had to say. When we look in the gospel, the book of Matthew chapter 7 tells us that the people were astonished at his doctrine because he had taught with such power and authority. 
when we go even to Luke 4, when he goes back to his hometown Nazareth, they were mumbling and jumbling and asking the question, isn't that Joseph's boy, that carpenter's boy, that boy who we don't even know if Joseph is his daddy. But by the time we get to verse 22, it says that they were amazed at the power of the words that he spoke. Do I have any help in the house? And even when we go down to John chapter 7, a few chapters before, the Pharisees wanted to get Jesus before now. So they sent soldiers out to get Jesus. And lo and behold, when the soldiers came back, they were in empty handed and the Pharisees said why don't you have Jesus the soldier said because we were astonished by the words that he had to say I tell you Jesus could talk Jesus when he spoke he had a way with words when Jesus spoke things happened I tell you in the Bible when Jesus spoke we saw sick people get healed when he said be healed when Jesus spoke he called demons to come out of people and they had to jump inside of pigs and run into the depths of the ocean and drown themselves when Jesus spoke to storms storms had to shut their mouth and calm their wind and peace be still when Jesus even spoke the dead folk they had to come out of their mummified state the roll of the stone had to go back and they had to come out of their grave when Jesus spoke and am I talking to anybody in here today that's glad that every now and then when Jesus speaks a word in your life your life changes for the better that's why the old saints used to say there's a change that's come over me why because Jesus spoke a word in my life I tell you I'm glad that one day I got a word from the word and you want to know what happened to me I changed too and that's why my testimony is things that I used to do I don't do as often I wish I had some help in here and places I used to go I, I don't go as much as I used to do I have anybody in here that'll give God glory for progress in your life and you wouldn't have had progress if there wasn't a word <laughs> hallelujah Je Jesus, Jesus just had a way with words. Jesus just was able to speak to us in any time in the Bible when they got a word from the Lord. He had a way to deal with what they were de dealing with, with the words that flowed from his mouth. And so I ask myself, why in the world was Jesus so profound and deep at all times? That's because the, I was informed by the Holy Ghost that Jesus always knew what what to say he always knew what to say and he always knew when to say as if somebody ought to miss that he always knew what to say he always knew what to say and he always knew when to say it and even at the point of death he gives us three of the most profound words in the entire bible as he hangs there on the cross he says with a loud voice it is is finished doesn't seem to be too deep but it's some of the deepest words in the gospel it is finished so i need to know jesus what did you say and jesus says number one i said it is finished in the original language i said to test to test means uh, paid in full Jesus what you mean paid in full Jesus says to me sin has been paid in full why is sin paid in full Jesus he said because in your humanity you are not able to pay for the sins that you committed against the Lord and you were not able to come up with enough cash enough clothes enough cars enough condos enough cute and cuddly colleagues in order to pay off your debt that is called sin so you needed a perfect specimen to shed his blood so that your sin could be paid in full and somebody missed their shout right there because I don't think I'm the only one that's had some sin in his life promiscuity felt good sexually but it was too expensive for me to pay for Girl, that intoxication it gave me relaxation but it was too much for me to pay for 
cussing somebody out uh, and knocking a Negro out that got on my nerves uh, made me feel better temporarily, but it was too expensive uh, for me to pay for. Uh, Saints, that's why when the devil tempts you with your sin, uh, you ought to sing that new hymn of the church to the devil. Look him in the eye and say, Satan, uh, your price is way too high. You need to cut it. Uh, but praise be to God, uh, I got somebody who was able to pay it. Uh, Anybody in here can holler with me one time and say, Jesus paid it all and all to him I owe. Yeah. He, 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 he always knew what to say. He said, to tell us that paid in full. But then he knew what to say. Why did you say it is finished, Jesus? Jesus said because the process of redemption was complete. The process of redemption was complete. Redemption had pain and redemption had a plan. He took everything, help me somebody, that we were supposed to take. He took the bump, Dr. Curry, that I was supposed to take. There's no better line, brother, than Jesus uh, because every time I should have gotten the cut and took some wood, he got behind me and took everything uh, that I was supposed to take. Is there anybody here that can thank God uh, that the pain of redemption was paid for by him. Yeah, you thought you were hurting and you thought that you couldn't get through, but you just received the reverberation, baby, because the Bible said that the devil comes but the kill, steal, and destroy. And if you got through your sin and woke up the next morning to pray that same lie, God said she got me through it, I never do it again. And you still hear the Day, and knowing that you did your sin, you ought to know that Jesus took the pain for you. I'm so glad today that he took the pain for me because I was not able to take the pain for myself. If I had to pay for my sin, I'd be hurting right now. If I had to pay for my sin, I'd be pushing up daisies right now. But is there anybody in here that can say he took the pain for me? Not only did he take the pain for me but he fulfilled the plan for me because when one sinned in the Old Testament they had to find a blameless calf or a blameless bull but now as grandma used to say you don't need to put the blood on the door you don't need the bull anymore someone has taken the place of the lamb and he is the great I am. He took it for you and he took it for me. He knew why. He said what he said. But you want to know what shouts me today is that he knew when to say what he said. You really missed your shout right there. Because if you've been to Sunday school one time, you know that a crucifixion is when someone is hung from a cross and the way they die is not from the hanging. The way they die is because their arms come out of the locks of their shoulder. And when their arms come out the locks of their shoulder, their lungs start to fill with blood. And they start to suffocate to death. But here's a man in front of all his enemies who he just asked God to forgive. In front of all of his enemies that he took care of his mama in front of in front of all his enemies he cries out in victory when he should not have been able to talk he speaks in front of his enemies and says it is finished is there anybody here that thank God that you got at least two or three enemies because I heard David say that he prepares the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Is there anybody here that can say, I don't 
don't care what hater is in front of me. I'm going to eat what God put on my table because he knows when and he knows where. And so I ask the Lord, why do you bless me in front of my enemies? He said to me, because your enemies got to know that even though they lied on you, even though they stabbed you in the back, even though they ruined your reputation, what God has for you is for you. And no devil in hell can take it from you. If you're in the house today and you're so glad that he's got power to bless you, to restore you why don't you high five somebody and say neighbor there's a word from the Lord and the word is that he is my shepherd and I shall not want is there anybody here that knows there's a word for you the word says that in your life you'll have tribulation but be of good cheer because he's already overcome is there anybody here that's got a word I got a word for somebody that's sick he is Jehovah Rapha and I don't know how you feel about it but I'm so glad that whatever darkness the devil puts on me it's just temporary but I'm glad that whatever the Lord does it's eternal I'm going to my seat but grab your neighbor by the Holy Ghost hand and rock him and shake him and shake him and rock him look him in the eye like they've been born again and say neighbor oh neighbor weeping may endure for a night but Jack come in the morning say yay say yay yay Hallelujah. Come on, hallelujah. Come on. Is there a witness in the house? Come on, y'all. Come on, shout it out. Yeah! I feel a praise in the house right now. What a word, what a word. My God, my God. It is finished. Oh, I got to interject because I got some policemen out there that want to know. There's a silver Lexus tag that got hit outside. Tag 37409J. You're right close to the front area here. Silver Lexus. Uh, it's not finished, but you need to go outside. Silver Lexus, Silver Lexus 37409J. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood for me. Come on, y'all. I was lost. He died. I know it was the blood for me. Jesus died. Come on, I know it. I know it. The blood 
came streaming down. The blood came streaming down. The blood came streaming down for me. Jesus. I know him. For me. One more time. I know it was the blood. We're going to need it. I know it was. Come on. I know it. Anybody know it? For me. Jesus died. Come on and praise the Lord. 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 Hallelujah. When he finished with it is finished, I thought we was going to give the benediction. Hallelujah. I thought that Pastor Maxwell was my friend. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to Jesus. Amen. 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 We thank the Lord for what he's doing. Amen. Amen. And for the word that has already gone forth. One of the things that my bishop taught me a long time ago is don't build on somebody else's fire. Because if I tried to build on that, I kill all of us in here. <laughs> so we bless the Lord. Let's bless the Lord one more time for these preachers. <laughs> Hallelujah. I have the seventh word coming from Luke 23 and 46. Hallelujah. It says, and when Jesus cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hand I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Another translation says that when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he breathed his last. Thus ends the reading of God's word thus far. And for a subject, a brief subject, I just want you to look at somebody and tell them you got to put it all in his hands. Come on, look at somebody on the other side and tell them you got to put it all in his hands. Put it all in his hands. For the last few minutes, we've been listening to the words that Jesus spoke from the cross. To those who were not only standing by, but standing around, as well as standing afar off. Words of forgiveness, words of salvation, words of affection, words of agony, words of humanity, and even words of victory. But now we've come to what some say is the final word. The word that some say is the word of committal or even the word of submission. This word, my brothers and sisters, is not only the final word, but this word is an interesting word. Interesting because in its thematic perspective is dual in nature. Now, at first glance, one would think that the theme here is the father or even his spirit, lowercase s. But careful study or a deeper dive, if you will, will cause you to see that the central theme here is really hands. Stay with me and I'll show you what I'm talking about. The text says, and when Jesus cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And now the word Father here not only denotes a relationship between Jesus the Son and God the Father. But it also gives us the focus to whom the cry was directed. See, his cry was not to those who he cared for. 
neither was it to those whom he called for. But his cry was directed to the one who had called him. Now give me a few minutes to work it out and I promise you I'll be finished as soon as I'll get through. But allow me here, if you will, to interject by saying prior study of this text reveals that in those days to say you were the son of literally meant that you were equal with because your substance was identical to the one from whom you were derived. And so if the truth be told on this morning, and I believe I shall tell it, in actuality, Jesus was simply crucified because of his relationship with God. Y'all going to pray with me? Not only this, but his surrender of the precious denotes the importance of protecting that which is valuable. And that is the spirit. But how many of you know this afternoon that, th that though proper perspective is necessary and proper protection is vital, without proper placement, it will all be for naught. Look at the person next to you and tell them, you got to put it all in his hands. Come on, tell somebody on the other side, you got to put it all in his hands. Now, allow me here, if you will, to interject by saying proper placement is crucial in the sense of being able to retrieve it later. Proper placement. Proper placement is crucial in the sense of being able to retrieve it Later, I want you to put a pin right there because we're going to come back and get that. But Jesus, whose hands were used to heal the sick, raise the dead, comfort the lost, and even cause the lame to walk. After hanging there so long, could not even be used to help himself. Hands, my brothers and sisters, is defined as the extended faculty of the body. Located at the end of the forearm or forelimb, equipped with the sensual impulse of touch. And although they can hold many material things, the hand is not capable, Pastor, of handling the immaterial spirit. And this Jesus understood quite well. For you see, it was there on the cross that Jesus' dying prayer was not to place his spirit into the material hands of man but into the immaterial hands of his father which brings me to my first point of interest you gotta watch whose hands you entrust your spirit you gotta watch it you gotta watch whose hands you entrust your spirit now this word entrust means to assign the responsibility for doing something or to deliver in trust to in other words, believer, it means to commit to another with confidence. Ah, isn't it amazing, believer, how easily we with confidence put our lives into the hands of those who are no better off than we are. Isn't it amazing how we find it hard to trust God who has all power and yet trust folk that have no power. Why? I want to know today, why is it, my sisters, that we keep giving our lives and our hearts away to men that, had, that say they love us, when in actuality, all they want to do is use us? When will we get back to the place where we are putting our trust in the hands of he who holds the world in his hands instead of, instead of, I want you to understand, instead of he who has, who doesn't have a pot to, you know, and a window to throw it out. To entrust means to charge with a specified duty. It means to commit to or put in charge of. And I don't know about you on this afternoon, but who better to put in charge of my spirit than he who created all of our spirits? Not only that, but when Jesus said into thy hands, he was describing what is known as an anthropomorphism. Which is actually.
actually the act of ascribing human form or attributes, if you will. I want you to understand it. It was ascribing human forms or, or attributes, if you will, to something that is not human. In this case, that would be God. And anthropomorphism, my brothers and sisters, are used in scripture to better help us understand what's being communicated to the reader. And so Jesus said, into thy hands, I commend or commit my spirit. Not only was he implying something deeper here, but he was, what he was saying here was simply this. Not only is God spirit. But he's also omniscient, meaning he's everywhere at the same time. So to place my spirit in the hands of God really meant that I was placing my spirit or my life, if you will, in the vastness of who he really is. For only a God who's everywhere at the same time is capable of holding and keeping this priceless deposit called the spirit. Furthermore, believe it, I'm about there, but the text started off by giving us the proper perspective of who Jesus was talking to. And from there, it showed us the importance of having proper protection for caring for and protecting that which is valuable. But there was one more thing that I told you that was greater than all of these. And that's what I want to deal with right now. I told you to hold on to it. And that was proper placement. For you see, having a proper placement is crucial when it comes time to retrieving deposits at a later date. You see, where you place your valuables are as important as how you place them. Let me say that one more time. Where you place your valuables are as important as how you place them. And I don't know about you or who this is for, but the reason why some of you can't retrieve your stuff is because you don't know where you placed it. The reason why some of you don't know where it is is because you don't know where you placed it. Look at somebody one more time and tell them you got to put it all in his hands. See, when you give it to God, it doesn't get lost. You can go on about your business and not worry if it's protected or not. When Jesus gave his spirit to the Father, he did so knowing that one day soon, he was going to retrieve it and step back into who he was. I'm headed back to Laurel. But before I go, I needed to tell somebody a few things. You got to put it all in his hands. Instead of putting it in the hands of man, put it in the hands of he who separated light from darkness. I hear you thinking, and I know you're saying, well, pastor, that's easier said than done. You don't know what I've been through. Well, no, I don't. But you got to put it all in the master's hands. No matter what you're going through, if you put it in his hands, the truth of the matter is this. Everything is going to be all right. For the father's hands are not like any other hand you can be in. His hands are able to take nothing and turn it into something. His hands are able to take a broken heart and mold it back together again. His hands are able to pick you up and turn you around and place your feet on solid ground. His, able, his hands are able to catch every fiery dart and throw them back at the person that's throwing it at you. I'm almost there, but you got to put it all in his hands. The last thing. And I wanted you to know is that the text says that when Jesus put his spirit into his hands, he breathed his last breath or gave up the ghost. What are you saying, preacher? Well, what I'm saying is this. Because Jesus committed his spirit to God, he felt secure enough to breathe his last breath. I'm ready to take my seat now. But Jesus said, no man taketh my life, but I lay it down. In other words, Jesus controlled when he would die so that he could take it up again. But he couldn't die until he committed his spirit into the Father's hands. What's my point? The point is this. When you commit your spirit or commit 
yourself into the hands of God. Stop breathing. When you commit your spirit into the hand of God, stop breathing. Some of y'all are waiting to exhale. But I hear the spirit of God saying, breathe your last breath and give it all over to God. Look at somebody and tell them, commit your spirit and stop breathing. You got to give it over to God. Every problem, breathe your last breath. Every temptation, breathe your last breath. Every lying demon, breathe your last breath. Every person that's talking about you, breathe your last breath. Give it over to God and breathe your last breath. You got to give it over to him and breathe your last breath. The song used to say, be not dismayed. Whatever be time, God will take care of you. Stop breathing. And one day, you'll breathe again. I know you're waiting for the point, but the point is when you give it to God, you don't have to worry about it. You can stop breathing. All of my burdens, all of my problems, I'm going to put it all in the master's hands. We used to sing a song that said, all in his hands. I put it all in his hands. All of my problems, all of my burdens. If I had a question, I put it all. Yes, I put it all in his hands. And for those of you, for those of you that may be wondering, well, Pastor Lisa, how can we take our last breath? How can we put it all in the master's hands and yet breathe again? Well, I'm glad you asked. For you see, when Jesus died, the Bible lets us know that God performed CPR on him. He ceased the power of death. He purchased back his creation and he resurrected his son. God is waiting to perform CPR on some of you, but you got to cease the power of death. You got to let him purchase back creation so he can resurrect you from the situation you're in. Put it all in his hands. It doesn't matter what it is. Put it all in his hands. We got to put it all in his hands. Whatever you're going through, put it all in his hands. We've heard the seven last words of Jesus and somebody needs to know today that it's time to put it all in his hands somebody came with a heavy heart but you gotta put it all in his hands somebody don't know which way to go but you gotta put it all in his hands look at your neighbor and tell him I'm gonna put it all in the master's hands though he's slay me yet will I trust him I'm gonna put it all in his hands I might be down now but God's gonna raise me up so I'm gonna put it all in his hands put it all in the master's hands god bless you i'm on cpr right now cpr there may be someone right here after that tremendous word all seven words after that major words you may need to give your life to christ the Bible says you have to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that he died for your sins. My God, my God.